Hello and welcome everyone to our panel, Digital Platforms and Ecosystems, the Markets and Marketplaces of the Future. My name is Ralph Hirt and I'm the CEO of AW8 Global Business Builders and uh, providing the CovQ platform and assessment to help companies grow and deliver the full potential. The platform index created by Mr. Hosseini and uh, Dr. Holger Schmidt from Dijk's Digital Economy Investment has experienced exceptional growth over the last years and outperformed Nasdaq, Dow Jones and all other major indexes by a large margin. Seven out of the 10 largest companies by market cap run platform business models. Like no other digital business model platforms have shifted the balance of power in many markets and industries. A steadily growing share of value creation is shifting from the producer of a product to the interaction manager between supply and demand. Those who are able to add and develop additional flywheels around the core seem to be unstoppable and leverage economy of scale benefits and network effects to the most extreme extent. In short, digital platforms and ecosystems are simply the supreme models of value creation. Today, we want to better understand what it takes to create a platform company and related ecosystem and what are the hurdles that need to be overcome. I'm extremely delighted to have some fantastic speakers as panelists here today who have seen it all. We have here with us Terry von Weibra, Managing Director, Numenos, Germany. He held leadership roles at Amazon, Yahoo, Karstadt, and was the Alibaba GM for EMEA. Terry is from LA, uh, but calls Munich his home for more than three years, decades, sorry. Brandon Denewell, Chief Executive Officer, Dynamico, Minnesota, U.S. Sorry, I don't know what happened. Hey, Tofi, we are already live. Welcome. Glad you can join us. Uh, so, Brandon, uh, Chief Executive Officer, Dynamico, Minnesota, a HubSpot CRM platform partner. Brandon spent many years in South Africa and Namibia as well. Then we have Tofi Saliba, Chief Executive Officer, Toda Network and Privacy Shell. Uh, he's based in San Francisco, dialing in from uh, Toronto, Canada at the moment. He can dive incredibly deep into AI, machine learning, and all aspects of cybersecurity. His perspectives will be extremely valuable for sure. Brittany Stoller, Chief Executive Officer of Open Growth Ventures USA. Open Growth Ventures incubates companies helping entrepreneurial teams build lasting companies and as a platform enables collaboration. She also runs My Family Lounge, which is a one-stop membership-based lifestyle management company. Of course, she's Silicon Valley based too. Then Dennis Wedderkorp, independent consultant and digital leader based out of Germany, ex-eBay, one of the very first large platforms and today working with Wonderflat amongst others. Wonderflat is a German Airbnb type of business model. Terry, we love to learn more about you and of course all the secret sources Amazon and Alibaba use, if any at all. Uh well, secret sauces, um, Ralph, I would say the secret sauce would be our subject today, which is um, marketplaces or more specifically the virtuous circles that um, that run marketplaces. Um, that's the only secret sauce I think I'm allowed to divulge, but it's it's the main one. So, um, you know, for me, um, marketplaces has certainly been the common theme of my work. Um, at Amazon, at Yahoo, um, where I launched the advertising marketplace um, and at Alibaba. You know, Alibaba has 49 different business units. Each one is a standalone marketplace, um, whether it's B2B or B2C or whatever area, but each one does so. And the, the common theme is really, aside from the being marketplaces, is that they're about connecting sellers to buyers, but in, in very, very different ways. So, you know, when I think about marketplaces, um, there's many different kinds, right? There's the, the marketplaces for consumer products we all know. So B2C marketplaces like Amazon or, or Alibaba's Tmall. There's um, information marketplaces like Google. Um, there's information entertainment or entertainment marketplaces like Netflix. Um, information and entertainment marketplaces like the Apple Store. Each of these are different. Some of them are not completely open marketplaces, but each are using a different marketplace model. Um, and I think a big issue that I see is a lot of confusion coming from the fact that many marketplaces, including some of the biggest ones, get confusing because the owner of the marketplace is playing two roles. They're both the operator of the marketplace, but they're also a first party contributor to the marketplace. 
All right, we all we all know this. We all see this. When Amazon sells something, it's a first party seller. How they started back when I was working there, that's that's what we did was first party seller books. Um, but they also have a very large third party marketplace. And a brand like Nike could be both showing up as a first party um, um, vendor through Amazon and a, and a third party seller. And um, that has a lot of benefits, um, but it can add to a lot of confusion. And I think we're seeing that um, more and more. Um, I think another thing is just, you know, in general, the size and the power of marketplace is one of the reasons I think we're talking about it today. You know, in the West, marketplaces are becoming more and more dominant. That trend is definitely on the upward. Um, but in other regions like like China, where I work for Alibaba, marketplaces already completely dominate, I would say, control online commerce. Um, so the trend is very much in that direction. Um I guess the other thing I, I would just add is, you know, virtuous circle, virtuous cycle, flywheel, whatever what term we want to use. This is the power of the marketplace. I'm sure we'll talk more about it in the panel. You know, this idea that you have a marketplace and you invite people to participate. And whether those are sellers or buyers, you have participants. And the virtuous circle really works in the sense that if it's done right, every additional participant is contributing value from which all other participants also benefit. That's where you get the virtuous circle going. So if I'm on Amazon, every new seller is going to bring in more buyers, more, more consumers, which will benefit all sellers. Um, adding more sellers is going to bring in more, um, more buyers, more buyers, more sellers. That's going to reduce prices, increase competition, and bring in further new consumers. And this is how the virtuous circle can work. But virtuous circles are very easy to get wrong. They're very easy to break. Uh, and certainly one of the, I think, strongest things that, that Jeff Bezos ever did at Amazon was not launching marketplaces. He did that at the very beginning. Very few people remember. But it's when he actually moved the marketplace from being separate tabs called Z shops to being actually putting actually. directly on the product detail page. And when he did that, he almost destroyed his own electronic buyer's business because they had to compete with their worst enemies on their holiest of holy pages, but he made the decision that made it viable for the consumer to say, I want to compare prices and I don't want to look at the Amazon price on this page and the third party seller prices on this page. Um, this is how you create a virtuous circle, but those kind of decisions are not easy and are not necessarily obvious when they're made. So I would say, you know, as we go into the conversation, I'd be very interested to talk about the future of marketplaces. Um, I think when we do, for me, I'd love to explore this idea of what I would call um, a C to B personal marketplace and how people in the future may say, um, because I want to protect my data, there's more and more startups that are saying all the new, all new search engines are all focused on privacy protection. So if I want to protect my data, uh, I want to create a world where I control my data. I decide which companies I'm going to let see it. If you combine that idea, like you and I were talking about, Ralph, with uh, Tim Berners-Lee's new startup, Inrupt, which, which does that, and you combine that with the idea of C to B, then in the future, every individual can really have their own personal marketplace with their data, and they say, I'm going to invite companies on a selective temporary basis to access my data so they can see what it is that I want for products and services, deliver that to me, and then exit. But it's really a one-to-many personal marketplace as an idea. Um, but an interesting topic, I think, for the group uh, to discuss. Okay, wow, well, this was like uh, really super informative. I've got already 50 questions. Uh, we oh. just turn it here upside down, I guess, the marketplace and the platform economy. Um, maybe, uh, Brandon, you can uh, go next. You actually haven't been always in uh, tech. Maybe you can uh, tell us about your journey and uh, how you got involved in the platform business and also maybe uh, cover the B2B aspect of it as well. Yeah, thanks, Ralph and, and, and Terry. So, yeah, I, I, you're right, Ralph. I, I have not always been in, in tech. And as you said in the introduction, I, I also hope I have not seen it all because I think we all still have a lot to see. So I just a little bit about my background, as, as Ralph uh, alluded to. So uh, after completing my military service in the, in the South African Navy, my first careers were in duty-free. I worked for a big Swiss company. That and I was running their operations in South Africa. Went from there into commercial fishing, where we were uh, selling and marketing frozen fish from 
from Southern Africa, from Namibia and South Africa into markets in, in Europe, primarily Holland and, and Spain and Malaysia, Australia, and then the U.S. And then when, I, when, we, when we sold that company, my wife and I moved to Spain. And at that, at that time, it was in, this was August of, of 2007, life was pretty good. And we decided to start a, a real estate business. And the business was starting to go really well. We were starting to pick up clients really well. And then suddenly in 2000, towards the end of 2008, something happened uh, called the, now, now known as the financial crisis. And, and we lost our business within about 48 hours, which, which is then how I got to what we're now referring to as platform. So when I was retooling a, a word to say, well, what do I do now? And all the advice I was getting from, from friends and family was just go back to what you do, which is, you know, business and marketing. And I, at, of course, 2008 was a big time. You know, the, the first iPhone had launched, the Facebook had become a thing. And this was changing the playing field for, you know, especially small and, and smaller, you know, medium-sized businesses. And I saw, saw that as a massive opportunity. And, and our business, so Dynamico is a, a play on the Spanish word for dynamic, because as we were trying to come up with a name, the, the strategist who was helping us come up with a name kept saying to us, well, why, how are you going to help your clients? And we said, well, how we help our clients is by helping them navigate the changes in technology and how that, how that changes their customer behavior, in other words, buyer behavior, and therefore how they need to adapt, how they market and sell. And we've kind of progressed from there to uh, up until 2014, uh, two years after moving to Minneapolis, Minnesota, because the Spanish economy just wasn't recovering fast enough, we became a, a HubSpot partner. And for those of you who don't know, so HubSpot started in 2006 as a marketing platform and have now evolved to a full a full revenue operations platform, which which goes across not only marketing, sales, and customer service. Uh, but now it also includes the, the link to operations, which is essentially the back the back end of business. But our focus is, you know, as Ralph was saying, is very much on more on the, from a from a B two B perspective. So the platform HubSpot, uh, which is still seen by many as a, as SaaS, but really is 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 a platform now. And I, I I love the way that you know Terry talked about the the virtuous circle that HubSpot has created. So in, in 2010, they realized that they needed to create something bigger than just a software company, and they started their solutions partner program, which we are a part of. And together with HubSpot creating the software, we provide the solutions for, for all the customers who use HubSpot and then, of course, become clients of ours. Together, we all benefit from, from that platform. And I, I love that, that, that idea of the virtuous circle because we absolutely see that. And the philosophy of HubSpot is a big part of why that is so successful and why HubSpot is is growing so so fast. In fact, their co-founder, Dhamma Shah, just mentioned on Friday that they're not a unicorn. They're actually, I mean, he's a very modest person, but he said that they're essentially 15 unicorns because they've created a billion dollars in value every year for the last 15 years since they were founded. So that that's the, that's my my platform perspective, and I I really look forward to to the rest of the discussion. Yeah, this has been great coming from the I guess ocean ecosystem all the way to the platform ecosystem, but I guess the ocean doesn't really have AI and machine learning in this sense. And uh, Tofi, I think that uh, your world maybe you can uh, dive in here and give an overview about sort of the tech opportunities and also challenges that come with it. Sure. Um, it's funny that you're mentioning Ocean. You and I we didn't talk about this. I don't know if you'd find something. But anyway, we did uh, make noise about a year ago to launch a platform that is called Ocean. That's why I'm mentioning this. This is not staged, by the way. It just happened to be like I this. I did not, not know that. <laughs> and and uh, we do have a lot of followers. I'm an author of protocol. So every time we make noise of something, there's like about 50 copies in China already. Anyway, so there's a lot of people that started launching things called Ocean Protocol, Ocean whatever, Ocean this, Ocean that, Open Ocean. Anyway, the good news is what we're launching is called Earth64, and it is actually pretty much like a marketplace of marketplaces. It's basically an, an NFT uh, data structure. 
and I was not planning to talk about this. This is for some other discussion. About marketplaces here, what I'm extremely interested in, to talk about is mainly AI marketplaces. Because um, when we talk about NFT marketplaces, there are a lot of NFT uh, scams, and I don't want to get into that. Uh, we, we, we're more like technology enablers, uh, and we don't uh, necessarily provide the entire journey of the, the actual NFT. In fact, when you look at NFT money, is NFT, the dollar you have in your pocket is an NFT. Le the legal uh, system made it fungible, but it is non-fungible. Uh, Bitcoin by construct, for example, the smallest unit in Bitcoin is called Satoshi, it's also an NFT. And a lot of people don't know that. Anyway, so what I'm talking about, when I talk about NFT, I talk about the actual, the, the, the base structure of any the thing that is finite and unique needs to, needs to be NFT as opposed to like ledger based NFTs that they call them, hey, you know, you have Mona Lisa, suddenly you have your own, and there are a lot of marketplaces in that as well. Uh, so, but when it comes to AI marketplaces uh, that uh, I'm extremely interested in, it's, uh, it's basically when you have about 50 engines trying to compete to provide, the, whether it is the business or the end user with what you're actually looking for. And effectively this can serve some other thing that is happening from machine learning that not a lot of people paying attention to, and it's called HBGA, which is a human-based genetic algorithm, but it becomes that the human is the component that it's uh, doing the, the validation without having to get paid for it. It's actually your pain. So when you pay $10 for that engine to give you certain services, say, you know, uh, certain sorting algorithm or like image processing or whatnot, you're, you're going to select one out of those 50 engines that they're going to give you the best result. So there are a lot of marketplaces in, in AI and they're likely to take over anything that it's a single company. I don't, I don't expect a single company in AI to take over the world. I think marketplaces will take, will take over, uh, especially when they are, uh, um, they have certain governance that it's uh, decentralized governance as opposed to certain centralized, because if it is centralized, then it is up to that centralized entity to determine a certain thing. But when it's done properly decentralized, uh, you end up having the the winner of those engines to continue to get better over time and there's the incentive you want to get paid if you're running your certain engine so so that's something that I'm, I'm noticing there's a lot of traction in uh, when it comes to ocean the reason why I mentioned that is because we use in the nft uh, world uh, we call it earth based nfts and the reason for that is if uh, you do have a Mona Lisa sitting in your basement it is unique to the world and many ledger basis and they come and tell you oh nft it's unique you now you put it on the ledger that's false that's only unique on that ledger whether it is like you know ethereum or whether it is algorand or whatever it is and they say some of them they say it doesn't fork but any computer scientist can clone it so you don't want to be in a marketplace where you can be cloned many times you only have one one lease in the world so when you mention ocean, what we use from the ocean, that's something that a lot of, not a lot of people pay attention to, is something that we all humanity have certain numbering system that we came to consensus of for its uniqueness. And that numbering system is the geo coordinates. Okay? It's the same in China, same in Japan, same everywhere. The metric systems are the same, religions are the same, politics, that's one of the things that we have. So we, we go down to the square centimeter and effectively that's the seven decimal. And effectively that's a unique number that exists around the entire world. So we call it Earth-based NFTs for those marketplaces. The other thing that is also unique to us on this planet Earth that we all use, another numbering system, it's time. So we end up like the time and space and we, we time stamped everything back to 2020 and we provided to the entire world to use. Basically, if you want to have a unique representation for planet Earth that cannot be forked, you end up using that data structure. So that's why like, I thought that it's a little bit funny when you say like ocean <laughs> and there's nothing in the ocean while well, we are using the ocean. Why the ocean? Because there's also the third global consensus that we exist on this planet Earth that nobody owns the ocean. Amazing. So nobody's going to come and say, he's like, hey, this square centimeter is above my land. We do have companies that are dealing with land ownerships. They, they do phenomenally well. But this one is just used specifically for those the three things that we have a global consensus on to power that marketplace. So I know we didn't plan to talk about this, Ralph, but you've mentioned Ocean. We've talked about the AI marketplaces, and now we talked about the NFTs. 
happy to talk to anybody. Hit me up anytime. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm active pretty much 23 hours per day. There's always one hour break that I take. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, that's been awesome. I mean, we are here also to uh, connect the dots, right? And so that's uh, what we are doing. And that also ties in uh, with what uh, Brittany is doing, which is really uh, empowering entrepreneurship, because that's really where it's all uh, getting started and what, what the source of uh, growth and innovation is. Uh, maybe, Brittany, you can uh, share some thoughts on, on this, please. Yeah, definitely. So um, I'm really excited to be here. Thank you, Ralph. Um, as he mentioned earlier, I'm the CEO of Open Growth Ventures. And just like Ralph was just saying, what our goal is, is to work on building out a diverse and inclusive digital platform that brings together entrepreneurs, startups and nonprofits to drive positive impact in the world. So we're creating a platform that ties everyone together into an ecosystem. And in that ecosystem, as a flagship of um, Open Growth Ventures, I'm also founding a company called My Family Lounge, which is a lifestyle management company that provides lifestyle and work-life integration support to family offices, CEOs, executives, and high net worth individuals. And a lot of the companies underneath Open Growth, uh, they actually operate as a two-sided marketplace. And a good example is a company called Design Everest, who's actually seeing tremendous success right now. And what they do is they connect architectures, architectures and engineers to homeowners who are looking to build custom homes or do remodels. And part of the reason why they're so successful is, is three main reasons, I think, at least, um, is, you know, the first one is they constrain the marketplace. So they really looked into location services and they took a hyper local approach, uh, meaning they stuck to key city. So they stuck with the Bay Area. They made sure that they were able to prove the model. And from there, they expanded to Southern California, and eventually they went to the cities in between. And the long-term goal that we have for Design Everest is to eventually expand even further. But I think the main key was there, there was to prove the model based off of the location and the services that they were providing. And the next piece um, is kind of the, the marketplace economics uh, for every party that's involved. So this included you know, pricing for homeowners, payout prices to our architects and our engineers, Uh, the margins for Design Everest, making sure that they were getting enough revenue. Um, and this was all extremely important when we were sticking to creating a market fit. Uh, and from there, that's when we started to think about scaling. And the last thing that I think is, you know, extremely important um, to have a successful marketplace is, is software or automation. So we went ahead and created a software hub to make it a true managed marketplace. Uh, so this was basically created to cre create less friction between you know, the architects, the engineers, the project managers. Uh, so in this uh, hub that we created, we stored contracts, uh, projects were tracked, et cetera. Um, and you know, it, really, it really does take time to kind of create the right strategy for a marketplace. And that's why we like to say at Open Growth that we stick to a two-step process. So the first is obviously you know, proving the model by constraining the marketplace, like I just talked about. And the second is then scaling from there. Um, so, you know, we really have focused on creating managed marketplaces uh, moving forward. So that's why we are going to kind of continue the same model with uh, My Family Lounge. We've done this with a couple others, uh, another one called Open Growth Academy, which is connecting learn, uh, people with different mentorship and learning opportunities. We've created Fusion Talent, which is a platform right now of over 5,000 girls uh, globally around the world that we're going to connect them talent-based with people in the U.S. to help support startups and nonprofits. Uh, so we're really honing in on, uh, you know, understanding how to slowly but surely master the, the science of creating the two-sided marketplaces and helping invent the future of work and life uh, by bringing suppliers, you know, customers, technology, and managed PMs together. I think that's great. And in, in particular, the managed marketplace or managed service, I think is maybe an uh, important aspect, especially at the beginning, because there are also many marketplaces being created and then not so much is happening. Either it's a supply or demand issue or, you know, there's simply help needed to get uh, things going. And uh, some facilitation, I think, is uh, an important aspect to it. Uh, great. Thank you. Uh, Dennis, uh, you were involved uh, with this e buy Uh, one of the first huge uh, successes as a marketplace, uh, the household name of auction uh, already in the 90s. 
Um, what, what's fascinating you about the market space? You're still involved in another market space uh, many years later, so there must be something. <laughs> yes, thank you, um, uh, Ralph, uh, for having me. Super excited to be here, and thank you for facilitating. Um, so when when I started my career, actually, um, I co-founded and built one of the first digital social media agencies here in Germany. And that's when I also first experienced hyper growth um, that come with platforms. So I have big brands and companies like Vodafone, Louis Vuitton, NSC to get on Facebook. Um, but I also quickly realized the risk that um, came with it, um, seeing how brands um, bought lots of likes um, just to learn quickly after um, that they won't be able to reach them organically or um, seeing the rise of lots of gaming app startups um, that um, diminished as quickly when when Facebook shut down these features. Um, but um, also firsthand experiencing building a company from one, five to 120 people within five years around that business. So that got me hooked and uh, moved on then in 2013 for the next um, almost seven years um, advising eBay classifieds, the C2C business of eBay, and saw that when you focus on the needs of both the demand and supply side in the marketplace and having a crystal clear consumer to consumer purpose, then you're actually able um, to even outperform your parent company. Um, so today, um, when you look at eBay and eBay classifieds in Germany, classifieds has more reach, has more usage um, than than the um, parent owner company. And um, having said that, eBay started in Germany as one of the first internet love brand. And um, yeah, the best practice marketplace example. But you can also see here marketplace is not a definition for unlimited success if along the way um, you might lose your focus and um, customers out there don't know anymore. Is it a C2C platform? Is it a B2C platform? What What is it? Um, just to be generic um, is not um, the one answer and you can see similar effects within the last 10 years in the US uh, where you see basically the dismantling of Craigslist where basically every vertical turned into a highly successful marketplace on its own. And within the last 15 months, uh, I was interim CMO um, of Wunderflats, uh, which is Germany's largest platform for temporary furnished housing. And I helped it um, there grow 100% um, within these crazy COVID times. And mm -hmm. while well, usually on a marketplace, supply always attracts the demand. Um, um, when you have external effects like COVID, where basically no one can come to Germany and rent out houses, then, then you need to become creative and build even better solution for a domestic market and uh, focus on demand generation or what we also did building on what we said using ML AI, for example, to increase matching quality on, on the platform. So um, maybe summing up um, the three things that, that keep me um, being in that area is One, the hyper growth potential that comes with it and managing the risk within it, um, building on Terry's uh, marketplace definition, really understanding both demand and supply with a clear value proposition. And third, um, the agility to respond um, to external factors um, within these platforms. Okay, yeah, that uh, sounds all great. I mean, the The one point that you were making, I think, is really important with the business model of uh, platforms. It's just less static and, I guess, more agile, which is why many platforms actually navigated through the pandemic pretty successfully, some extremely successfully. Some had challenges, of course, as well. So it depends what their focus is. But overall, they were just adapting uh, much, much better than conventional uh, business models. Uh, maybe uh, one question for 
uh, Terry, to start with, uh, what do you think? How long can the large platforms grow? Where, where's the limit? Are they unstoppable? And probably some when, but uh, when is that? In 10 years, in 50 years, or in 100? I would say, Ralph, um, the sky is literally the limit. And with Jeff Bezos going off into the sky very soon, um, another business, not Amazon. It's, it's um, pretty high, the sky. <laughs> yeah, so um, I think marketplaces have a lot of growth ramp in front of them. Um, I think it will be um, – marketplace is the strongest value creation business model of the last – 20 years, if we just look at the market cap of Amazon, Alibaba, Google, and the others, nothing else has created more value in that sense. I think it's going to go um, quite a way still, but um, you know there will be there will be distinctions. Um, I don't, for example, see um, some of them being able to succeed across the all. Categories. Amazon's been very good at expanding to lots of categories. I don't think its model can work across all categories, um, and then there'll be regional issues. Um, Amazon is very strong in many continents across the world, not strong in China. Alibaba is very strong in China and, and, and not so strong outside of Southeast Asia and China. So I think there are limitations there, but uh, the growth has got a long ways to go still. Yeah, I, I agree. I can't really see it stopping anytime soon, that's for sure, apart from maybe the maybe regulatory issues. But uh, how about cybersecurity, Tofi? I mean, you know that space uh, very well. And I came across some um, numbers on a project that I worked and I thought it's uh, mind blowing how many attacks are out there of all kinds. Is there risk to those businesses like massive risk or is it under control? Uh, I'm, I'm, my focus in cybersecurity in uh, how to secure AI and not to bring AI into cybersecurity. So it's uh, mainly when it's an angle that not a lot of people pay attention to. And it's effectively when folks tell you, it's like, our AI is secure. Don't worry. Trust us. Secure from whom? From an outsider? I'm worried about you. Mm. Okay? So if you are Amazon, and if you are Facebook, or you are Alibaba, or Google, whoever you are, Today, I'm totally fine if you can have control over my cell phone. The technology is getting to the point where it's going to be embedded in us, whether you guys like it or not. It's going to be a pill. That cell phone's going to be a pill that you take it, okay? Now, imagine it's, uh, at the same time, AI is a trillion times more powerful than what it is today. The one angle that not a lot of people pay attention to is the governance of that AI. So if it is going to be Uh, you know, Facebook that controls that AI, would you give that uh, pill, and I've actually asked Mark Zuckerberg, would you give that pill to your daughters? Or would you give a pill that is actually secure from having it to be attached from the company that is actually managing it? So that kind of security that not a lot of people pay attention to. So of course, something like that, I cannot do it on my own, or not any of my companies. I mean, we have over 20 companies in our network, and Each and every one, some of them, they skyrocket, some of them, they go under or whatnot, but they're all like tight in budget. I'm not going to go and run a project that's going to benefit the entire planet. So I brought it to the IEEE. With the IEEE, the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers, uh, they basically said, okay, fine, you're, you're the global chair for the AI um, uh, you know, protocols for, for security. And with that, what we're hoping to do is get enough awareness, and we are getting the attention of a lot of folks, because not a single AI scientist in the world that can say that this problem has been solved. No one, okay? This is, they say, oh, well, you got to trust somebody at the end of the day, but, but the, the point here is that the, this is, could be more dangerous than nuclear warheads, okay? So the one who is managing it could be a nation that you don't trust at all, or a company you don't trust at all, and that's the same one that's going to have control over your children, okay? So it's extremely important when it comes to the governance of how you bring cryptography into AI to secure it in a certain way, that it, it, cannot, be, uh, it cannot be controlled, it cannot be repurposed, because mm -hmm. if it can be repurposed, it will be repurposed. So, that, so when I took the, this, my, my sister jokingly, she's like, is this... Uh, your 97th job along with 96 other things that I'm doing. 
Right? So, so, of course, this is not something that I do full-time. I wish I had the time to do it full-time, but, of course, you know that how important this uh, something like that. So we have about 17 to 18 members now uh, that we will be announcing next month, and this initiative was just announced like last week with the IEEE. And you, you all know IEEE is extremely credible. It's actually the number one in the world when it comes to the amount of uh, uh, electronic engineers and software developers in it. So we have a whole South Korea, but if anybody's connected to other nations and presidents or whatnot that they want to host us as well, please reach out. This is extremely important to the humankind. Yeah, it's amazing uh, how, what uh, I guess complex uh, subject it is, the global ecosystems, marketplaces, platforms, how everything is interconnected. And at the same time, it's also not only top down, but uh, bottom up, maybe a uh, Brittany, can you maybe share some uh, examples, you know, how your portfolio companies get going, you know, how they get, you know, to this critical mass that you always need to build momentum in the marketplaces? Yeah, so it, it, um, it can happen in multiple different ways. So we are a very open platform. We take somebody who's willing to be you know, an entrepreneur for 10 hours a week or somebody who's looking to build the next big thing. So it, it depends kind of on what type of individual or uh, small team we're working with. Um, but typically they get integrated into our ecosystem and organically work together as an ecosystem. So there's some companies that are stronger within recruitment, some that are stronger within technology. And until they're able to get to a point where they can sustain on their own, they operate with the ecosystem. Uh, so they feed off of each other as well as get support from open growth as a whole. So we come in, we help them with strategy. Uh, we help them with overall vision and, and growth and until they get to a point where they're able to operate on their own. So again, a little bit different depending on what type of entrepreneur they are, uh, but they, basically follow the same the same process through that. Uh, so Design Everest, for example, the one I was speaking about earlier, um, they uh, have been around um, for about 15 years or so, really high focus for about six years. Uh, so they are at a place right now where they're operating on their own. Uh, when they do need support, we jump in and we help them out. Uh, but they're, you know, operating solely by themselves right now. Or there's other companies like My Family Lounge, with which we're incubating right now, uh, Fusion Wellness, Fusion Talent, Open Growth Academy, those are still in the earlier stages. So they get a lot more support from Open Growth and the ecosystem itself. I love to hear that there's also the human touch still involved and it's not just going automatically where it may uh, get led. Um, in the B2B space, uh, Brandon, I guess there's still some more of, I guess, the solution sales to get things going and uh, I guess proof of value propositions and other things. Uh, can you share your experience maybe a bit to get an integrated solution going? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess the, the, the one the one thing I'm thinking about, as you as you mentioned, that that human aspect. I think when 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 we have topics like this, you know, about digital and platforms and ecosystems and what have you. I mean, if you th if you think back, ecosystems really are about nature. The meaning today, you know, if you ask a, a, a 14 year old what what an ecosystem is, they'll tell you it's some sort of technology ecosystem. The I think. We, we lose sight of the fact that without people, there's, there's no point for us to be doing any of this and, and building any systems and building any solutions. And we're also, we're, we're trying to solve for, for, the, for the human. And whether, whether, you, whether that's B2C or B2B, you know, whether you're trying to help a, a group of owners or shareholders grow a, a, a business you know, who then employs lots of people, et cetera, et cetera, or you know, you're trying to help people solve problems or find products that they need. At the end of the day, the, 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 you know, the human is at the center of everything that we do when we design the platform. But we, in the way we, the way we speak about it, we often forget that we're, there's, a, there's a human that we're solving for. Uh, but, it's, but it's interesting because, of course, you know, the, the, the humans are also going to be the ones who are burned if we, if we don't get these you know, platforms built correctly. And if they're, and if they are exposed, which is a big, 
you know, a big topic of conversation that we were just, you know, getting to now around, you know, security and, and what have you. And that, you know, that can be, you know, hacked or entered into from any system of, of any kind of business, whether it's B2B or B2C, always, again, with, with our, you know, human data at, at risk. And who knows uh, what what can what can be done with that? And that's of course it's a it's a very very it's it's it seems kind of boring that we have to worry about the security, but but the security is the one thing that that can collapse all of this and and more, which is very sad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we don't want to finish here on a sad note. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> maybe. Um, since we only have a few minutes left, uh, sort of, you know, what are you, I guess, uh, each of you, your, your general thoughts on, you know, platform and marketplaces and uh, what sort of the, the, the key point, you know, the audience uh, should be taken away from this um, session we've just had. Brittany, do you want to go first, maybe? I think you're muted. Thank you. Sorry about that. There you go. Um, but yeah, I, I think the the main key takeaways that I would say um, is, you know, make sure that you're gaining the traction, the critical mask and the the product market fit before you scale. And I, I know I feel like a lot of entrepreneurs make the mistake there where they try to scale too quickly. So I think uh, from my point of view, that's my biggest takeaway here is um, make sure you you pay attention to that first and, and then try to scale second. OK, cool. Uh, who goes next? Brandon, maybe? Uh, whoever? Yeah, Brandon is on mute, I guess. Oh, yeah, you're on mute. You're on yeah, mute. I mean, yeah, I, I guess, I mean, just sort of to, to go back to where, where I ended the, the last part of it is at the end of the day, we, you know, we were all trying to be you know, more, more efficient and, and better at what we do so that we can continue to progress, you know, as, as humans and, and, um, and I think if we just think about the, the positives for, for now, as we sort of wrap, wrap things up here, I, I do believe that, again, you know, everything comes back down to, you know, people, process, and we used to say technology, I say, we now say platforms, right? So people, process, and platforms. And I believe that if we build each each flywheel, you, you have the big flywheel and then you have all the little flywheels, the big flywheel, but always thinking about, you know, people, process, and, and platform, I, I think that's going to be around for, for a very long time and, 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 and still the most effective way that we can probably scale any, any kind of business or organization. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Uh, Dennis, we were just basically asking each um, panelist to, um, I guess, make the last couple of points on this subject. Anything you can point out or, or share? Yes, um, sorry for, for dropping out my internet connection is not stable, but maybe the one thing that I would um, like um, to give um, also the um, to the ones active in the room, the economist just um, four months ago wrote in a very interesting article, um, even though the perception is here like sky's the limit and like these big tech companies grow, grow, grow and are getting more powerful, which is totally true on the one side. But on the other side, um, if you look a bit more closely, then no matter if it's Uber and ride hailing, Alphabet and advertising, Amazon and cloud, Netflix and streaming, Visa and payments, all are um, losing for the last five years um, um, relative revenue market share to the second and third uh, companies. So it's not the case that um, we're um, getting into a world completely dominated by monopolies, um, but we see other forms and um, it's not always a success um, story. Um, we don't speak about the thousands and hundred thousands of marketplaces um, that fail all the time. Um, so um, it's it's quite uh, quite an effort to build a successful one um, and it's not guaranteed that you stay stay on top. Yeah, the, the winner doesn't take all, but a lot of it, I think. Uh, Tofi, what, what, what's yours? Sure. I mean, we have one minute, so I'm going to say sexy. S-E-C-S-I. Uh, security, efficiency, confidentiality, scalability, 
and then interoperability. That's what I pretty much focus on because I speak more from technology perspective and let other folks worry about marketing and advertising and so on and so forth, which uh, was alluded uh, here uh, by Brittany. Um, that's not so much my expertise and that's what I focus on is, is security, efficiency, confidentiality, scalability, and interoperability. So I call it sexy. People easy to remember. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. Terry, what's yours? Um, I would say marketplaces, so virtuous circles are very, very powerful um, when they're done right. When they're done only partly right, they are basically worthless. So a half-ass virtuous circle is worthless. So do it right or don't do it at all. Okay, fantastic. So uh, a big thank you uh, goes uh, to all of you, uh, panelists, you. Uh, as well as uh, the audience. Uh, we wish you a great time at the remaining sessions of the Horasis.